Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm so glad you're here with us on this beautiful Thursday morning. My name is Kelsey Derringer, and I am the Professional Development Coordinator for Bird Brain Technologies. So that means that I get to work with teachers and students all over the world and help them think about how to bring creative robotics into their classrooms or their homes. Um, as always, we are joined by our director and producer, Matt the Robot. Hello, Matt. Hey, Kelsey. How's it going today? I'm doing very well. I got my sun tea. I got some sugar in it. I'm ready to go. How are you doing, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm excited to answer the questions that are going to be coming in from Facebook. That's right. So we are live on Facebook right now. And so if you are watching us on Facebook, you can comment live on our video and we can bring your comments into our session live as well. If you especially have any questions as we're going through some different things today, be sure to leave that in our comments and we will bring those questions into class today. Um, but it's not just me and it's not just Matt here. We also have a whole classroom full of teachers today. Teachers, would you like to wave hello to Facebook? Hello, Facebook. <laughs> so these teachers, this is our panel for today. Um, I think uh, uh, all the people here have a variety of different experiences um, with creative robotics, with hummingbirds specifically, um, with coding in general. Um, but all these teachers here have, have been teaching for a while and um, have great uh, questions and great answers for what we're going to be talking about today. And what we're talking about today specifically is robot poetry, which is why I'm so excited for our featured guest today, our extra special guest, Melissa Unger is with us today. Um, and Melissa, would you like to just introduce yourself briefly? Hi, I'm Melissa. I teach kindergarten, first and second grade STEAM at South Fayette Elementary in Pittsburgh. And I'm really excited to talk about ways that we're using robotics with our ELA curriculum. Um, in building those experiences for our students. That's right. So in today's teacher talks, we're really going to be focusing on the teacher perspective of, of working with creative robotics. Yesterday, we did robot poetry, and we were really focusing on the student experience of engaging with poetry through creative robotics, especially virtually. So we actually had one of your students join us yesterday, Melissa. Um, he was a really special, special kid, and he had some great code and great thinking about about poetry, so that was really cool to, to have him on yesterday. Um, but uh, so um, let's start by just grounding us in the poetry activity that we did yesterday. So what we did is we took a specific poem. We took the poem Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. And I'm going to switch over to this camera here, and you might need to help me focus it, Matt. Um, but we took the poem Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. And we took it and broke it into stanzas. So this was the first stanza. It's about the place where the sidewalk ends. It's got this white, soft grass, the sunbird resting, or the sun burning crimson, the moon bird resting from its flight. And then we um, made a little poetry project to go with that. So I'll rearrange my things here and plug this guy in. So here's the poetry project that we made that goes with this stanza. And then when I plug it in, you'll see how it moves and lights up and really kind of represents this stanza of the poem. So you can see the sun burning blue and crimson back there, the moon bird in its flight, it's flying around. And then <laughs> a feature we thought was pretty great was the, uh, the fan on the top with the peppermint in front of it, creating some peppermint wind. <laughs> and what the students did is we had it coded so that um, it was kind of moving like this, but, but we asked them, how would you change this to go with the stanza a little bit better? So that was the first stanza, and we're using a, uh, a rotation motor back here. Um, we've got a position servo that's controlling the bird. And there's actually a pretty cool little mechanism. Um, the, way th the reason the bird is sort of uh, not staying quite stationary is it's attached on there with a magnet. There's a magnet on the back of the bird and then the motor has a magnet on it as well so that's letting it sort of spin freely. And then we can actually pull that out so you can see it. Say again. Okay. You can see the magnet just came off. But there's the bird with the magnet on the back right there. And so back here you can see Oh. I just broke it. Um, <laughs> but 
there's the, there's the motor moving with the magnet on the back of it. So I'll unplug this one for now. There we go. Scooch it back over here. And then that was the first stanza. The second stanza, we had another project that went with that one. So this stanza is talking about the part of the, the, the part that they just left, so not where the sidewalk ends. This is a place where the smoke blows black and the dark streets winds and bends, right? And so this is our version of that. We made this busy little city with some black smoke at the top, and then we made some chalk white, we made a chalk white arrow point to a couple different places. So let me plug this one in. You can actually see the color in the sky best when you really make it dark. So you can see the arrow kind of pointing up to the hill, and now you can really see that dark sky back there changing colors. And it was, we had some really cool discussions with the students um, yesterday talking about color and feeling and, and what those things might mean. Um, it was pretty interesting hearing what they had to, had to say. And then the last part, um, after we talked about those two stanzas, is we looked at this third stanza here, and we asked the students to design what they thought the robot project for this third stanza would look like. Um, and it was really cool seeing what they came up with. So a lot of the, uh, most of the teachers who are here with us at Teacher Talk today were also with us yesterday during the robot poetry um, uh, lesson. And I wonder if I can just hear from you guys, um, what, did you, what did you see from the students yesterday? How did you see them engaging with the text, um, engaging with the robots? Um, what are your reflections about seeing the students learn yesterday? And you can just kind of wave your hand in front of your screen. Yeah, James. Make sure I thought uh, the third stanza was the one that impressed me most, where they had to use their imagination, and some of the uh, kids came up with stuff I would have never thought of, especially the kid that said that the adults can't see the the street and, and the post, and the, the student had to guide them, and that was what that was all about. So I would have never come up with anything like that, but I thought that was great. That was, I agree, that, that project was really cool. They, they had those chalk white arrows and they had a kid who could see the arrows and see the sign and an adult who couldn't see them because the, the children mark and the children know. It doesn't say the people, it says the children. And so he was like, oh, well then that must mean that adults don't know. Um, and this was actually Melissa's student. And when he was explaining his drawing, it was, it was super cool. And um, the, the in-person version of this project is much more of that. It's students reading a poem and coming up with what they think the project would look like from it. Because we're doing it virtually, that we've pre-made the projects that kids can program, but ideally when they're in class and in school, they're looking at a text and, and generating a creative robotic solution to representing that. But what else did you guys see or what else surprised or, or delighted you or flummoxed you about what you saw the students do yesterday? with the poems. Does anyone have it? Oh uh, yeah, Melissa. I liked how it seemed like the students really dove into the details. So one of the things that I noticed with the students uh, when they were programming the tri LEDs was they weren't just putting colors in there to put colors in, but really thinking about the words in the text and making connections that way. Yeah, I, I loved that too. I loved how um, the, uh, again, the, your student, I was asking him, you know, what, what color did you put behind there? And he was like, well, I made it kind of blue. And I was like, why blue? What, is, what does blue make you feel? And he was like, well, blue reminds me of being by a lake. And I was like, oh, well, how does being by a lake make you feel? And he was like, like sunny and warm and calm. And I was like, oh, and, and we took a look back at this first stanza. And it, it, it's a very sort of calm stanza, soft, white, you know, before the street begins, before where the hustle and bustle is, the sun is bright, the moon bird rests, like it's the peppermint wind is cool. So when he was talking about, he kind of like got this like calm, sunny feeling and he translated that to blue and it was just so interesting hearing his creative process in in that that was really cool 
Um, anything else? Yeah, Nick. Yeah, there was um, one, one kid especially picked up on the moon bird actually resting, right? So it went and stayed low. Remember that? Yeah. Um, Mira, Mira um, uh, had the moon bird just kind of rest in the grass, and she, she decided that the best thing for the moon bird was to just not move at all because it was supposed to be resting. One of the students made the moon bird like stay over here longer and stay over here longer, so they increased like the pause in between. But one of the students is like, if it's really going to rest, it should just it should be like sleeping, like not, not moving at all. And it was, I just thought that was such a bold choice. It's like, there's this motor, you could make it move, but no, it's resting. It was just, oh, it was such a beautiful little moment. Um, any other reflections of what you saw from the students, how you saw them engaging in the, uh, in the text that you'd like to offer up? Yeah, Paul. I thought it was kind of interesting to watch how they were paying attention to very specific details in the poem and um, how they were going to implement those details. Yeah, I, uh, I, I thought that was really cool how they were picking, picking up, you know, we picked up on the word crimson and I asked the students, what, what is crimson? And, you know, uh, one of the, one of the, Evelette said, it's, it's really deep red, like blood red crimson. And so, ooh, what is that? How does that make you feel? And what, what, how would you represent that? You know, we have a color in there and you could represent it with color. Um, but it was it um, the original this original robot poetry project was actually done with um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll actually link you show you the original um, post about it um, I'll come over here this is from a, a, a presentation um, I did at ISTE last year about um, creative robotics as a tool of composition and so the these are the the original project was done by um, Sue Mellon uh, with uh, a, a couple other teachers and um, she was uh, working with a gifted and talented classroom and um, was trying to get especially her boys to engage in poetry because they were like mm, poems they're full of feelings lame <laughs> right? but she let them she gave them a choice of poems and they picked a noiseless patient spider because it had a spider and that's hardcore I guess and um, then they, they worked all week, you know, building this noiseless patient spider um, uh, project. And then they got up at the end of the week and they, um, they gave a presentation. And one of the students, Joe, he said, uh, so there's a, a, a moment in that poem where it talks about filament. And at the beginning of the week, they did not know what the word filament meant. And also in the poem, there's a metaphor. There's two stanzas, and the first metaphor is talking about a spider, and the second metaphor is talking about something a little bit squishier, like feelings and the soul and ideas and things like that. And um, Joe got up, and the first line of their presentation, after they like stopped poking each other, because, you know, they're seventh grade boys, he got up and he goes, the filament leaving the spider is like feelings leaving the soul. And Sue said, like, in, in the article about this, she's like, my jaw just dropped. She was like, did you get that on Spark Notes? Like, where did you come up with that? And he was like, no, no, we argued about it. You know, we said, was it more like feelings? Was it more like ideas? And her, her um, uh, um, reflection on this was that the students had to go back to that primary text over and over and over again to figure out how to make it, how to craft it. So the more time they spent reading the poem, arguing about it, designing, building, programming, and creating resulted in the more they understood the poem. So it was a way for them to engage with that primary source text. And, and we saw that yesterday. Even though they, the students yesterday did not create these projects, um, <clears throat> they did program them, and so they were able to be creative in the way that they were programming them. Um, so do you guys have other questions about... Um, this project in particular, and, and then I'd love to hear from Melissa about a, a similar project that, that she was sharing with us yesterday um, that she'd done with students engaging in text, but what other questions do you guys have about students engaging in a text through creative robotics, or other thoughts do you, what other thoughts do you have about that? Yeah, Gerald. Um, my question is a little bit logistical sure. in the, and I wasn't I wasn't able to attend yesterday, but I'd like to know more about the cycle of the students interacting with the text 
and then building and coding. And I'm, assur I'm assuming that happens iteratively. I'm wondering if you or Melissa could talk about like how that works in the classroom. Yeah, and, and I think some other teachers here might have some experience with that too, but I'd love to, to kick it to Melissa first. When you did, do you want to tell a little bit about your Flat Stanley project and then how you saw the students interacting or, or with the, the other, the, where the wild things are, um, whichever one of those is, is most appropriate, but how you saw the students interacting with the text and coding and programming, what was the cycle there? How did that work? Yeah, so I can, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, we did a project where different groups of students had a page in the story where the wild things are. And so they were responsible for that scene and bringing it to life so that we would have uh, sort of like a, a real life uh, retelling of, of the storybook. Um, but we kind of started by having the students really dive deep into their page. And uh, if you're familiar with the story, some of the pages have a lot of text while others just have a line. Um, and even others are just, just pictures. Um, but not so much getting the students like you need to really focus on each and every word, but really focusing on those ideas. So whether you're finding your images or your theme in the, the text itself or within the images on the page, um, having students just take time like verbally talking with each other and drawing out some of those ideas um, from each other by like asking questions or just communicating with the teacher. Um, but then we kind of did like what Kelsey had everyone do yesterday in the third stanza. So once they talked about it for a while, then actually physically draw it out and map out, um, here's your idea, how is it going to move, what code might you need. Uh, with my students, we always tend to write out our code first so that they can really break the steps down, which I think is super important, especially um, for my students who are younger, because we do this with our, our second graders, um, to help them see what they're really asking their materials to do. Um, but then after they've planned, after they've talked, after they've planned, then start creating it. Um, and then going, keep going through that cycle of iterating on their design and fixing things if need be, um, showing them off and getting feedback. Um, and when I've, uh, robot poetry is one of my favorite ones to do as a professional development. So teachers who've never done robotics before, teachers who don't teach poetry <laughs> even, um, but you know, I'll have them pick a poem, um, read it. I'll have them go through and find all the verbs in that poem, the verbs and the color words. And uh, if they have it printed out, um, you know, uh, uh, underline it or just write them off to the side if they're finding it online. But the verbs are going to tell you what and how sh things should move in there. And then the color words, um, you know, or the feeling words can help you decide what colors you might put in there. Um, but like they kind of do a reading of the poem, you know, read it once just to understand what's going on, read it again to pick out those words, design something. And then as you're going, you know, well, how about we find some adverbs how does it move? Does it fly slowly? Does it fly lazily? You know, um, go back and find some of those words that describe the action word. So it's a way to kind of engage with parts of speech. And, you know, when I was a middle school English teacher, I just, I wish that I'd had this tool because teaching parts of speech is dry. <laughs> it can be dry. <laughs> and um, it's a, a tool I wish I would have had. But um, yeah, Nick. Yeah, this is for, um, <clears throat> for Melissa. So essentially you had the kids writing pseudocode uh, in a way, but how, how did you get them to do that? What, what was your approach to uh, what language to use or how to structure it? So my students are, are quite young. So we do this, we start this with our, our second graders um, and they're pretty familiar with Scratch Junior. So they they have a lot of experience with Scratch Junior um, and we do a lot of the, coding with Scratch or with Make Code. So like thinking about how they can, um, if they can kind of name the step or name the action that they want their robot to take, then how do we take those actions and put them into the, the code and what would it look like in code or what would you call it in code? Um, and so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll start with um, something simple like the whole class will work together and maybe we just want something um, to rotate for five seconds and then blink on and off. Um, so instead of just having, just saying that's what we're doing, then having the students sort of make a checklist of, okay, what's the first thing I need 
um, if it's going to rotate to the left, what, what do I need to make sure I tell the computer? Um, and then kind of send them back to their tables with that checklist, whether it's just on a note card or a piece of paper or just on the chalkboard, um, so that they know these are kind of the five steps that I should have on my screen before, before I'm done. It's such a great way to get them to think through that, even at that young age. You know, I think a, a lot of teachers ask me, how, how can I engage my students who are too young to understand what a percentage is? Right, percentages are probably not a second grade skill, um, but uh, uh, how can I get them to engage in code? And just going through that process that you just described, Melissa, is, is awesome. Um, and Paul, you were telling us in the chat about a project that you do. Um, oh, and sorry, Nick, it, it, it seemed like you were, you were gonna ask a follow-up uh, question. Have a follow -up sorry, I was mm -hmm. just gonna say that getting kids at that age to actually um, delve down into a detailed sequence process and analyze the process seems to be a, a difficult thing. But um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not a teacher, so I just my thinking about that, I would have thought that would have been very difficult to get the step-by-step the -step thing. Well, you know, you have to break off from everything else and just go focus step-by-step. Step. Well, yeah, no, definitely it is. We do a lot of like unplugged coding activities first. So like uh, one of my favorites is just having one student pretend to be the robot and the other students be the computer programmers. And it's, uh, you know, like, we'll have your robot start here and go sit down at the desk. And, you know, we talk about, well, if, if that was a human, you would just say like, Johnny, go sit down. Um, but because we're pretending that this is the robot, you really have to break down your steps. So I think doing little activities like that helps the younger kids start to see um, see that it, there's a lot there's more a lot steps, steps than they necessarily assume there is. I love doing those CS Unplugged activities. Code, did, did you get yours from code.org, Melissa? Is that where that came from? Yeah. And they I have, think the kids are really being part of them, too. Can you say that again? I think the kids really enjoy being part of them, too. And it's always interesting because, like, sometimes I'll even have them make, like, predictions. Like, well, how many instructions do you think it'll take for us to get him from point A to point B? And it's always a small number. And then as they do it, I tend to like keep tallies as they're like, okay, now take three more steps to the left and two steps to the right. And it always ends up being, you know, like 15, 16 different steps to get to one location um, to really like drive home the idea that like a sequence of code really is made up of a bunch of parts. So, so this would be like a move forward a step, turn left, move yeah. forward, turn left, move forward, etc. I love that activity. Chairs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, getting around chairs and even, you know, setting up some obstacles that they have to step over or something like that. I, I love that activity too because it's it's up out of their chairs. And um, I was I was teaching a, a CS engineering lesson earlier this week with some computer scientists who are working out of Berkeley, and they're on like the forefront of what's happening in computer science right now. And I asked them the question in this group of middle school or middle school campers. I said, "What do you wish that you would have known about computer science before you like got into it?" Because none of them went to undergrad for computer science; they discovered it later on in their careers. And they said, I wish that I, I had known that computer science is more than just coding. It's thinking through a problem. It's finding the logical steps to get you from where you are to where you want to be. But it's also like determining where you want to be. So it's like setting goals and then finding the logical steps to get through it. She said, it's really cool logic and it's really cool math. It's not just sitting down and like blah, 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 blah at a keyboard. Like it's, it's thinking. And so that activity that you, that you did, Melissa, um, having students uh, give commands to another student, it, it's up, it's physical, it's fun, it's silly. I'm sure they giggle a lot during it. I'm sure, you know, I could see it, I could see them like doing it blindfolded and like trying to sit on the chair and missing the chair and like, oh no. And like, that would be such a, a like, those kids are going to think computer science is fun and computer science is silly. And coding is a, something you can do with friends. It's not a solitary activity, right? So that activity I love for communicating so many other implicit things about coding and computer science too.
and as a way to prep them for the idea that sequences are, probably need to be more detailed than you think they do. Definitely. That's great. Um, so, uh, um, Paul, if, I, if we go back up just a little bit um, in, in the comments, Paul, you had talked about a, a unit that you currently do using a poem called The Wumpaloons That Never Were. And um, can you talk a little bit about what you do with that project right now? And you said you could see adding some creative robotics to that. Sure. What I do right now, I teach a K-5 technology. And um, what the kids do, there's a poem called by Mark Prinsky, I think it is, The Wumpaloons That Never Were. There's all these colorful descriptions of a Wumpaloon, but there's no physical descriptions of the Wumpaloon. And so the kids need to, I, I have them go through and find all the colors. When you said crimson, that that's what made me think of that because crimson is one of the colors. And some of the boys get it because they know the crimson tide, and, you know, but there's, there's like 30 different, <laughs> there's like 30 different uh, colors in it. And then after the kids have found the colors, then they use kid picks and draw their own Wumpaloon. And I could see them taking that and moving it to a, a foam board. I use a lot of foam board because I can get it very cheaply for the kids to actually either print their picture and cut it out on a form, foam board. And then we'd get into the different parts of the, the tail, the head, the body. And they could very easily then, you know, think about how it's going to move, when it's going to move, where it's going to move. And, and then we could put those together and let the kids code that. And I think I'm um, we use a lot of cardboard. <laughs> yeah, we we use a lot of cardboard here to build with. But yesterday we were building with foam core, and uh, Matt was just Matt was having some reflections about foam core and how awesome it is to work with. So um, uh, just you know, it's got a little bit of paper on front and a little bit of foam there, and it, it is a, ends up being a really nice building material. Um, you said you get it for really cheap, Paul. What's your Dollar Tree? What's your source, man? Dollar Tree. <laughs> like phone core phone. You get a, a, Dollar. a Dollar Tree. You get a poster size piece for a dollar. I love the Dollar Tree. <laughs> and I get the, the, the Dollar Tree. We get the um, three knives for a dollar and screwdrivers and all of our parts. And sometimes it's fun to just walk through the Dollar Tree and use your imagination. Say, ooh, we could do this with that. Yeah, we're we're getting lots of uh, lots of thumbs ups in the chat. They're like, yeah, yeah, Dollar Tree, what up? <laughs> uh, a lot of people use Dollar Tree. I just I also love that like we're um, you know we're talking about about doing robotics and coding with you know dollar materials. It does not have to be expensive. It does not have to be um, expensive in terms of of materials. It does not have to be it, it, you know what Melissa was just talking about teaching computational thinking, teaching CS doesn't have to involve a computer even. You know, it's something where when your Wi-Fi is down in your school and, uh, or you're, you're sitting outside um, having a fire drill, you can do a computational thinking activity. Like it doesn't have to exist in the computer lab, you know. Um, we had gotten a question earlier as well about just thinking about materials. You were talking about foam core, Paul. Um, where we got these six by six boxes from, um, we use these a lot in our, in our um, activities because they're sort of standardized. They make it easier <laughs> for us to, to store. Matt, the robot, is very interested in, in boxes. I wonder why. Um, <laughs> but uh, we use these a lot um, because they're sort of standardized and we get them for cheap. So um, our boxes, these are these like six by six boxes that we get from, um, from Uline actually. And we order them in bulk, like we order like a hundred of them. And then these things are just so dang useful for, um, you know, it's sort of a standardized thing that students can use. Um, I mean, I highly recommend that, you know, people use recycled materials, use cereal boxes and things like that. But if you're searching for something that you can order in bulk and cheap, six by six by six boxes from Uline work really well for us. We also like these little, these little three by three by three ones also from Uline that we just, um, uh, you know, also order from Uline. But uh, those, those help us, especially when, we're, when I used to travel and do robotics. I could flatten those down, pack them in a suitcase, and take them somewhere. So teachers who teach on a cart 
or something like that. Um, those boxes may be helpful. If you don't have the ability for your students to bring in recycled materials, um, you can get those for pretty cheap and they make good building materials. You can cut those up and make other things with them too. Um, in the in the chat, uh, uh, Eileen had asked a question that I, I wanted to respond to. It was a, a Zoom question, actually. It was Eileen was wondering whether in Zoom, if the boxes where people are are stable, and the answer is no. And I'll show you why. So if we go to gallery view, um, and if you guys go to gallery view on your Zoom screen right now. Um, Paul and Nick, would you guys do me a favor and turn off your video for a second? Yep, so see how Paul and Nick just moved to the end? And now if you guys turn your video back on, then you'll come back on, but you'll still be down there. So whenever a student, um, yeah, whenever a student turns off their video, they move to the bottom. Um, and it also is like the order in which they join. Sometimes it's the order, if you go to breakout rooms and come back, it's the order in which they speak. You know, they'll get bumped up to the top. So, so where they are on the screen does not stay stable. We've thought about doing like, everybody put your hands out like this and we'll play like patty cake. But there's, it's also what you see on my screen and what you see on your screen are different. So um, could be a fun way to do a coding activity, but doesn't work on Zoom. Um, some people were sharing some other resources for intro to coding activities too. Um, Gerald shared, uh, I'll, I'll show this one over here. Um, Gerald shared this drtechnico.com. Um, Gerald, do you want to tell us a little bit about this activity and where you found it and what, how it works? Sure. I remember I saw it in a blog post somewhere 100 years ago, but if you scroll down, if, if you could scroll down on the screen, Kelsey, there's a, um, a mm -hmm. what, the, what, the, what the teacher who invented this, uh, there's, a, there's a link, hang on. Um, it doesn't matter, but what happens is, um, the, in this blog post, the teacher's walking through um, something that he or she did, but what it does is it starts with a rudimentary language, which is just symbols for moving forward, backward, and turning 90 degrees in each direction. And so, like I think Melissa was saying, the kids, when I do it, and I've done this with, there it is, that, that, um, that rudimentary language. So what I've done with it, and I've done it with undergraduate and graduate students that I'm teaching robotics to, as well as um, late elementary and middle school students that I'm also teaching robotics and codings to. So they start with, it starts with um, the kids are given a task. One is the robot, one's the programmer to walk in a square, those kinds of basic things. And then it builds up to, they have to program. So the initial ones use the language that already exists. They then have to program their robot, the person to dance the hokey pokey. And so the challenge is to do it, that, to invent the fewest number of new symbols to accomplish that. So it's both the programming piece, but it's also dealing with the abstraction piece. Um, and they end up, mm -hmm. and so they they then perform it for one another to validate that the code works, but then they all, I also do a thing where they share the extra symbols and that becomes a whole discussion about what are instructions really and what are the what are the pe the patterns that you see that you're programming? So hopefully that answers mm. your question. Yeah, a, a very cool activity. Um, if you guys want to look it up, it's uh, it's drtechnico n i k o dot com slash how to train your robot with dashes in between. So you could find that and and look up that activity as well. Looks like something that. Maybe you could even do social distanced if you have a playground or, or a gymnasium to work in, so that, that could potentially work as well. Um, before we had started, there were a couple requests for of people to just kind of show how we set up the Microbit classroom yesterday for this. And so um, I want to go through that process just briefly um, so folks can see it. And then also link everybody to um, our slideshow that we made that has these resources um, available. So um, if you want to find the resources that um, the slideshow that um, uh, uh, tells you how to do remote robotics, this is the bit.ly link that will take you to that slideshow. So bit.ly slash bbt remote, the B, B, and T are capitalized. Um, so if you want to go to that link, that'll, that'll show you kind of a, a how-to. It gives you some like um, uh, advantages and limitations of 
Nets Blocks, Microbit Classroom, and Zoom Remote Control. Um, so feel free to head to that link. But let me show you specifically about Microbit Classroom, how to set that up. So I'm going to go back over to Google, and I will just Google Microbit Classroom. <clears throat> you can see I click on this link a lot. Uh, and I could go back, and it says, hey, you were in the middle of a session, and you left. <coughs> Do you want to pull that session back up? I don't. This was yesterday's session. I'm going to delete it and start again. Ooh. Got a little tickle there. Sorry. <coughs> so I'm going to delete that and make a new activity. I'm going to call it Robot Poetry Take Two. You select your programming language that you want to use. So I'll zoom way in so you can see it. I can choose make code or Python. I'm going to choose make code and then I'm going to hit launch classroom. And so now there's these step-by-step -step instructions. It literally takes the first time you do it, it'll maybe take 10 minutes to set up a classroom because you want to like read all the instructions. But after that, it literally takes five minutes to set up a classroom. So I'll zoom back out just a little bit so that some things are easier to find. Up at the top here, it says dashboard. This is how your students can join your microbit classroom. So I'll show you how they join. There's microbit.org slash join. So I'm going to go there. This is me as a student now, OK? microbit.org slash join. And then it asks for the classroom name. There's color with a U in it, because they're British. Um, animal, transport, object, and a pin. Um, and so we've got pink, mouse, tractor, saxophone. So I'm going to use the drop-down menu here, and there's a little, there's a, a scroll bar. Some people don't see that at first, but pink, mouse, tractor, what was the last one? Saxophone. How could I forget? Um, saxophone. And then the pin is 75, 38, 94. 75, 38, 94. And I hit continue, and this is where your students can name themselves on this next scre screen. Now, when, I, when we do this remote robotics thing, I also join as a student. And what this does is it gives us the ability to share other students' code with us as a student um, so that we can then download that code onto our robots. All right, so I always do this. And when I name myself, I, the, the names always go in alphabetical order, so I cheat and I make myself AA Kelsey 1, <laughs> uh, just in case I need to join as multiple students for any reason. I give myself a name there. All right, and then I join. And this is also how I prep the code that I want to send to students. So um, in order to program a hummingbird, I will need to add the hummingbird blocks. So I'm going to go to advanced, go to extensions, because I'm going to add a hummingbird extension. And look, there it is. And now those hummingbird blocks just got added to my screen here. So if I zoom in, you can see it says hummingbird. So now I would build some, some uh, simple code that I want my students to start with. So the code that we sent to students yesterday that they were, um, that they were using to code the tricolor LED and the um, position servo yesterday, this is how I built that code. I just built out whatever code I wanted them to start with. And once I had it uh, showing how I wanted it to, uh, we'd, uh, I'd, and I prepped this before the lesson, um, uh, we would then be able to share this code with other students. Um, so I'm just building some super simple and mostly non-functional code right now. But here's some code that controls a tri-LED and a motor. And it doesn't do anything yet because we wanted the students to do it, but we kind of prepped them with the blocks that they'd need. And then if I go back to, this is all in the student view, so I think Gerald was wondering, what does the student view look like? Uh, it looks basically just like make code. The one, uh, and you've got blocks here, and you've got JavaScript, so I can see everything I just coded in color-coded JavaScript. So you could request that your students use whichever language you want them to. Um, but uh, the one thing it doesn't have is it doesn't have that share button. So whatever students do on Microbit Classroom, Unless they just save the JavaScript somewhere, they can't really save this anywhere else. They can't share it anywhere outside of Microbit Classroom. So that's one difference between MakeCode and Microbit Classroom. 
Um, but then uh, um, when I go back to the teacher view, when there are multiple students there, I can share my Kelsey the student code. So I can go to student code, and I can see, hey, uh, this is not usually what it looks like. It usually looks more like this. All the students who have joined the class are going to be lined up here on the left. Kelsey and Gerald and Megan and Paul and Nick and Melissa would all line up down here. And I'd be able to click on their names to see what the code looks like that they're building. And I can scroll around and see in real time, I can see them scooching blocks around. I can see them changing numbers. And when one of them is ready to, um, when one of them is ready, and they, they usually, I do this um, synchronously on Zoom, I say, let me know when you're done and you want to download your code onto the robot. They wave their hand at me and I click on them and I say share student code and I share it with just me. You don't want to share it with other students because when you share code in Microbit Classroom, it replaces whatever the student was working on and I've made that mistake twice. And never again will I share code with students who like don't want it because that just like erases whatever they were up to. Um, so I share their code with me, Kelsey the student, and then when I go back here, I'll have their code on my screen and I can download it and put it on the robot. Um, so the, and this is all outlined, again, if I go to this bit.ly slash bbt remote, um, I'll go back here to show you bit.ly slash bbt remote. Um, this is a, a little slideshow we made with some explainers about how to do different things. So the first section is about nets blocks. The, section, the second section is about remote control via Zoom. And this third section is about Microbit Classroom. We have like how to do it. Um, and then we have, um, you can see their official PDF about how to do it. And we also have some like advantages and limitations of each of those types of coding. So we have like a little how to and then an, an overview. Um, so uh, definitely um, head to that. Uh, that um, link there if you want some more information about how we particularly kind of hack Microbit Classroom. Um, so I know that that was, uh, does anybody have any questions about Microbit Classroom, setting it up, using it the way that we do it? Um, or does anybody have any other questions? We've, we've got about um, maybe eight minutes left. Um, to have our discussion. I have a couple other questions loaded, but I want you guys to have the questions that you came in with answered as well. So let me go to gallery view and just check in on everybody. Um, what questions do you guys have? Yeah, Eileen. Um, if you have multiple hummingbirds, I mean, how many, many can you use on one laptop? How many can you connect on one laptop using which yeah, language? Uh, microbit. Microbit. Okay, so you're you're wondering about on uh, when you're using make code, how many hummingbirds can you connect at one time? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, using make code, just one at a time. Um, so you connect one and you download the code onto it, and then you would disconnect it and uh, hook up another one. Um, because with make code, you download the code onto the robot, and so once you download it, it stays on there. So with um, make code or microbit classroom, you just connect one at a time. So that is the reason that in our studio, we have this very long USB cord that can reach all the way across to plug into whichever robot we want to download stuff onto. Um, but you just do one at a time. If you're using Snap yeah. um, and using the Bluetooth feature of Snap or using the Bluetooth feature of like Bird Blocks with an iPad, you can connect up to four robots at the same time. Because with those, you don't download the code onto it, and so you're only connecting, you're only controlling robots that you're actively connected to. So you can connect up to four at once with, with those. Does that make sense? So in, in order to do multiple robots, like virtually with my students, I would have to use more than one laptop, right? If you're doing it with Microbit Classroom, you wouldn't necessarily need more than one laptop. You would just... Uh, whenever they're ready to download their, whenever they're ready for you to download their code onto the robot, you would just plug it into a different robot. Oh. You could do it all from one laptop, though, just fine. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Because with Microbit Classroom, you are the 
arbiter of downloads. <laughs> you, are, you are the decider of downloads. So you don't download it until, like, you do the downloading as the teacher. They don't have control over when you download. Yeah, OK. Yeah, what's and up, Matt? I'm, I'm kind of inferring a question here, Eileen. But uh, the, if what you're trying to do is create the experience that, for instance, Tom has set up in his office, where um, uh, anybody can remotely control a robot, um, uh, and he has multiple robots set up, that particular experience would not be available in MakeCode because MakeCode requires you to download every single time. Uh, that is why Tom, for that setup, is using NetsBlocks. Right. Um, also, if I had like a multi-USB dongle, because I love dongles, I'm a dongle queen, right? If I had a multi-USB dongle, that would be still, and had them all hooked up to the dongle, it, it's still, I would have to unplug and replug in, right? Uh, that, yes, because every, every micro bit that you plug in will sort of show up as a different drive on a, on a standard dongle. It doesn't actually split the, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, that nets blocks um, functionality, if you guys are wondering what, um, what Eileen's talking about here, um, if I go to, um, if I go to our at home page, you can see this, uh, this link, and so at home is at the top of all of our pages there. It's a purple button. But if I go to remote robots, what she's talking about is um, we've set up a system using Nets blocks. That was one of those remote coding things that I was talking about, where you or your students at any time can go in and you can program. I've programmed the dragon a lot. I'm going to program the city. All right, so here is the city, and you from home can program this robot that is in Tom's office. And um, I'm going to make that a little smaller so I can see a little bit better. Um, oops. Don't do that. <laughs> I don't know what I did. <laughs> there we go. All right. So um, in order to connect to it, there's some, like, instructions on here. But you hit your C key on your, um, on your keyboard. And then it will connect, and it'll tell you when it's connected. But you at home can program a robot. Uh, and, and all, what is that, five of these? All five of these are connected at all times because he's using Nets blocks. Now, I think, is he running all of these on different computers, Matt? I don't remember. Uh, I think he may have two computers because he's running five robots now. Okay. But uh, uh, he, you, one could run uh three, I believe, off of, um, okay. from NetsBlocks, off of a single computer. Yeah. So um, if you're running NetsBlocks, you can run up to three hummingbirds off of the same computer. And uh, we have a, a, somebody on the back end who's helped us with those, like, nest, we're using a nest camera so that they're available 24-7 all the time. And the nest camera has a little, like, 10-second delay built into it, so there's a little bit of a, a delay there. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, so uh, if you're using Nets blocks, you can connect up to three hummingbirds um, to the same computer for students to program remotely. And then um, Paul was asking uh, about Nets blocks. Are the hummingbird extensions on Nets blocks different between the bit, which is the new hummingbird bit, and the older duo? They're different, but they both exist. So if I go back to this remote robotics page here, um, it says, want to make your own remote robot? Follow our tutorial here. And the tutorial will take you through um, the different um, extensions and different ways of doing this. How to, it'll take you through how to set it up. It's got links and all kinds of different things in there. And it's got the different extensions for Duo or Hummingbird Bit to answer that question. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, but it looks like we have a, a question coming in. Is this from Facebook, Matt? Uh, yeah, this is from Sam, our friend Sam on, hey, on Sam Facebook. Hey, so Thanks for watching, <laughs> Sam. Um, uh, he had a very good question, uh, and it is this is a uh, ratio math question. How many hummingbird kits per student computer? Per student computer. Right. So if say he uh, Sam has 
10 student computers available to his classroom, how many hummingbird kits should he get? Ah, um, uh, I would say it's kind of a one-to-one -one ratio. Would you agree, Matt? Uh, yes. Um, I, I suppose it depends on how you structure that activity. For yeah. instance, if a certain set of kids is building while another set of kids is programming, um, you could potentially get, say, 20 robots built off of one computer. Um, but uh, there is, um, unless you have a very specific project in mind that is hooking up multiple hummingbirds to one computer, mm -hmm. there's really no need uh, to have more than one hummingbird kit per computer. Um, uh, I, I could imagine um, uh, instances where you'd want more, but in yeah. general. And yeah, uh, and so thinking about like actively in the classroom, a group of students, a group of like two to f maybe four or five students is going to be sort of um, huddled around a computer and a hummingbird and kind of going back and forth from the craft supply table, but like a group of students and a, a computer and a hummingbird, that's kind of what comprises that group. Um, if you've got like multiple class periods and you've got 10 computers, but this group, uh, this class is going to be building at the same time, period one and period three are going to be building hummingbirds at the same time, um, you may want to, you know, have 20 hummingbirds so that this class can have 10 groups and this class can have 10 groups and they're going to be sharing a computer between classes um, but not um, but not sharing hummingbirds but Melissa uh, you are a classroom teacher with this kind of experience uh, how do you manage that how many um, hummingbirds versus programming devices do you use in your classroom um, well I agree with I agree with what you said I really do think it depends on the project so um, I have 12 hummingbird kits and I use them. It depends on, again on the project, but if I want like a full grade level, what we've done is one robot per, per home room and uh, working together. But then if it's something where I want multiple robots in a classroom, then kind of what you said of dividing it up of a group is a computer and a hummingbird kit. Um, the, the activity that you did where students were working on this in their homeroom, so an entire class was using their whole, all of their brains to come together to make one project. Um, we're just about out of time, but I have a, a, a how, like, how did that go, an entire class working on a single project? What were the benefits and the challenges of that? So I did that with a second grade class, and it actually worked perfectly. Um, what we did, if you can kind of envision like a box being four sides, each team of students, which was um, between like four and six kids, uh, their team was responsible for a servo and two lights, or a servo and one light. And then also coding to add sound effects and text. Um, so the team itself was creating their scene, almost like those poetry boxes. Um, and then we were just putting them together as a class uh, to watch the, the finished product. So even in that, in that, they were all working on the same project, but the project had sort of like parts that they had divided up into amongst the class. Exactly. Great. Um, well, that's about all the time that we, that we have for today. This was a really robust discussion, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if we can all just, if we can go to gallery view for a second, just give ourselves a round of applause. Because this, <laughs> this is a great conversation. And thank you so much, Melissa for joining us today with that like very um, detailed teacher experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if you guys want to learn more about um, bird brain, hummingbird, or using creative robotics, um, there are a number of different um, things that you can do, join, and visit. Um, you can certainly visit our website, birdbraintechnologies.com. And if you're specifically looking for some ideas and inspiration to do robotics at home, you can do slash robotics at home. That's where you can find the um, remote robotics um, how-to page and get your kids to program that dragon or that city. 
Um, you can find ways to purchase hummingbirds for yourself, your classroom, or, a, or your family, a single hummingbird kit. Um, you can also find our courses that will teach you how to use your hummingbird. So if you're looking for a good place to start with your um, hummingbird kit, um, whether you're using a computer or an iPad or a phone, um, there's some PD courses that are available for free there as well. Plus, all of our upcoming webinars are listed there as well. We're going to be taking the next couple of weeks off from doing webinars to resituate a couple of things, plan, scheme, get some great partners involved. Um, so, uh, but we've got a couple webinars coming up in August. So certainly check those out. Those two webinars we have planned right now for August focus specifically on remote coding, thinking about how to use your Hummingbird or how to use the new Finch 2.0, which is gonna be shipping in October. Um, uh, how to use your Hummingbird or your Finch in like a hybrid learning model. So where some of your kids are at home, some of your kids are in class, maybe all your kids are at home, how can you still engage students in creative robotics when we're not all in the classroom anymore? Um, so definitely check out this uh, birdbraintechnologies.com slash robotics at home and sign up for some of those August webinars that focus on um, remote, remote learning and hybrid learning. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us, info at birdbraintechnologies.com. That can be questions about ordering, scheduling PD, about the Finch 2.0, about project integration ideas. We are here to help. And do please follow us and tag us on your social media posts um, because there are always teachers doing amazing things with our products. And we, um, it's a great place to get inspired by what others are doing. So once again, thanks everybody so much for joining us today. We're gonna end our stream to Facebook here. But if you guys on Zoom wanna hang out for a couple minutes, we have just a couple minutes we can spend with you. So thank you so much, everybody. Bye, Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to see what you make on social media. On Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, you can tag at birdbraintech or hashtag hummingbirdkit, or you can even tag me. If you have any questions, be sure to email us, info at birdbraintechnologies.com. We can answer questions about purchasing, about learning, about teaching, and about professional development. If you haven't been there yet, be sure to visit our Robotics at Home page. There, you can purchase a kit for yourself, learn how to use it, and even join one of our upcoming webinars. Until we see you in class, thanks for watching from everyone at Birdbrain Technologies.